Hello and welcome back to another episode of The Genius Podcast. My name is Karen Doyle, your host and founder of The Genius Project, an initiative for Catholic women designed to support and resource you towards growth in all areas of life and to call you into the fullness of who God has created you to be. If you're interested in any of our initiatives here at The Genius Project, can I invite you to visit our website www.geniusproject.co or you're very welcome to send me an email karen at geniusproject.co now ladies we are opening up a new intake for the catholic women's masterclass and this catholic women's masterclass is exploring four rhythms of renewal that can really see you living in the fullness of who God created you to be and your mission and your purpose and to help you establish some really healthy rhythms. In the masterclass, we explore things such as what negative mindsets and limiting beliefs are holding you back and how you can overcome them. We explore a rhythm of rest and what it actually looks like to live your life with this pyramid of priorities which we're going to explore in today's podcast. We also explore our key relationships such as marriage, friendship, how to have healthy relationships with people, as well as discovering your unique mission, gifts, and purpose. So ladies, I would love for you to join us on this four month journey of transformation through the masterclass. What you get is access to nine video modules that you work through over the four months, as well as a workbook, a free copy of the Metanoia Journal, as well as fortnightly group coaching sessions. Women have really said that these group coaching sessions have been such a highlight for them, where they get together with other Catholic women of like mind to receive formation and coaching in their daily life. So if you are interested or want to know more about the Catholic Women's Masterclass, Check it out on the Masterclass page on our website. On this week's episode of the Genius Podcast, I am joined by the very beautiful Dr. Joanna Howe from Adelaide here in Australia. Dr. Joanna is a Rhodes Scholar. She's an Associate Professor of Law. She has five children and she's an incredible woman of faith. In our conversation today, we roam across a number of topics such as how Christ has the power to reach in and restore and redeem the broken parts of our life. We also explore how we discern our vocational call and what this looks like on the ground level if we're called to career and the public sphere and also raising a family. And Dr. Joanna really speaks into this experience of being on that hustle treadmill and trying to juggle career while raising a family. And I know you're going to really enjoy this conversation. Towards the end of our conversation, Joanna shares where her career is taking her. And that is into this whole area of speaking up in terms of abortion and the rights of unborn children. So ladies, I really hope this conversation blesses you. Sit back, relax and enjoy this week's episode with Dr. Joanna Howe. Well, Joanna, welcome to the Genius Podcast. It's so fantastic to have you as a guest. You're joining us from Adelaide here in Australia. So a huge welcome to you. Thank you. So good to be here, Karen. Yeah, you reached out on Instagram a little while ago and it was so fantastic to reconnect with you because I remember many years ago, I remember meeting you when you were serving on youth mission team down in Melbourne. We lived there and we were studying down there. And so you've had quite the journey over those past sort of 15, 20 years. So would you just share a little bit about your background, who you are, and I guess just that connection going back so many years? Okay, so um, first of all, thanks for having me on. It's really nice to be able to catch up and to reconnect. I I think when we met, I was actually just on this massive journey because I was doing uh, economics law at Sydney University. I was heavily involved in university politics. And I think when I met you, I was doing volunteer work for the Catholic Church, Mm -hmm. Um, but I was also working two days a week for Bill Shorten at the Australian Workers' Union because I was very interested in pursuing a career in the trade union movement and Bill was someone I looked up to. And so um, it was kind of, I don't think there'd be many people that would be doing both. And actually in that same year that I met you, I was falling in love with the guy that I was ultimately going to marry. Except, of course, you don't know that when you're, yeah, you don't know that when you're falling in love. (laughs) 
someone. I wish someone had said to me, no, your life will work out. You'll marry him and um, you'll, you'll be married to your best friend. But at that time I was like, I'm falling in love with this guy and he doesn't seem at all like the type of guy that I've written down on my list. I'm working for this really um, ambitious trade union leader and I'm doing volunteer work and kind of getting deeper into my faith, despite the fact that, you know, my conversion to the faith had actually been quite recent, just Mm -hmm. a year before I started university. So I think in my early 20s when we met, (laughs) there was just a whole lot of things that I was processing and going through. Um, And in the intervening 19 years, the amazing thing I think about being nearly 40 is um, I feel like I've worked out a lot of that stuff, Mm. like, you know, kind of what I want to do with my life, the type of person I want to be, how I want to treat people, what my role is in the world. It's, you know, when I met you, I just had a whole lot of questions and I'm not saying I have the answers now, but I do feel like I've kind of um, learned them maybe along the way through mistakes and and just through life grow into ourselves don't we as we we get older I remember the same thing in my early 20s just feeling like who am I what am I doing same thing Jonathan and I've been married 21 years but back then he chased me for three years and I wouldn't go out with him it was like what's going to happen here (laughs) but you're right it's such a period those early you know, the late teens, early 20s are such a season of really trying to wrestle with and find our identity and our direction in life. And so I got a real thrill when you connected with me on Instagram going, oh, I do. I remember you so well. And it's so (laughs) wonderful to see where you are today and just the amazing work that you're doing. So share with us that jump in 20 years. What happened? Okay, so I finished up that year on the youth mission team and ended up doing another year. And then um, like my James and I, who's now my husband, we started dating and I went back to Sydney University and continued on with my law degree. Amazingly, like I thought that the break would really hurt my studies, but I got way better marks after taking two years off to do, you know, volunteer work. So cool. And uh, yeah, it was, it was, uh, that was, it was amazing to come back. I was a lot, I guess, further advanced in my faith and also in my sort of decision making around my life I left the trade union and said to Bill Shorten you know like I I love the work you guys do but I think it's not for me right now that the sort of the hustle and bustle of politics in my early 20s it was quite confronting and I think I just needed time to work out who I was and I didn't want to be a career politician I sort of felt like real world life experience was important Mm. Um, and then in my final year um, at Sydney University I learned that a girl I'd been to school with had got a Rhodes Scholarship and you know I'd always thought about for that Rhodes Scholarship because people like Bill Clinton, Tony Abbott, Bob Hawke people who have made a massive impact on the world have got that scholarship and it gives you that chance to go to Oxford. But actually when I found out my friend got it, I felt jealous and and that's so slack because she's a beautiful girl and we went to school together and um, I should have been nothing but happy for her, but I did feel jealous. I was like, why, why not me? Yes, yes. <laughs> and um, it sounds horrible to say, but then I, um, I yeah, you know, and, and I am Catholic and so as a Catholic, we, I don't know if secular people would understand this, but when we kind of have those ugly feelings, we go to confession, you know, you want to go to confession. So I went to St. Mary's and hit up a random priest who was sitting in a confessional. He couldn't see who I was. Mm -hmm. And I just said, you know, I named some of the sins that I'd been battling with and um, some of the bad choices and things in my life. And and I named the jealousy. And, mm-hmm. and, and, you know, it's so funny because often the priest will pick up at the end on that one scene that you tried to sandwich and hide. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> the one thing you don't want him to talk about, but he said, so who are you jealous of? Mm-hmm. And then I was like, oh, my gosh, do I have to explain? I don't want to, I don't know what to do. But I just told him, I said, look, I, this girl in my year group, she got the Rhodes Scholarship. I always thought that was something I wanted to get. But then since, you know, I just feel like I can't get it anymore. And and and, 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 and then he just said to me, well, why wouldn't you just apply if, mm. if it's something that you've always wanted to do, you know? And and I thought, well, like it was really funny mm. <laughs> because he was like being jealous. But it just like he just spoke that to me. And, yes. you know, he then said a prayer with me and then um, and then I left and I guess like I thought about it, prayed about it, called James and he just said, Joey, you should go for it. So I did end up applying. It's a huge process because mm. it's kind of like one of the most significant scholarships in, in the world. And so, you know, you um, I had to get six referees. I had to think about my personal statement and put that all together. And you have to be accomplished across a whole lot of fields. And mm. so 
putting it in was hard. And I think as women, we sometimes really struggle to like back ourselves and go for things. Yes. Um, yeah. But I am, you know, in, in John 10, 10, I've come that you might have life and have it to the full. And that parable of the gifts, the people that have gifts, um, those who use them and lean into them will be given more. And I, I guess all of that sort of um, stuff had influenced me in my thinking. And so decided to go for it, ended up getting shortlisted. It was the first year that ever shortlisted 13. They normally only shortlist 12. And um, a friend had said to me, if you, if they like you, because the first day of interviews is at government, ha government house. And they said, if they like you over the cucumber sandwiches and the champagne, the panel will talk to you. It was six eminent people like the governor of New South Wales, someone from the CSR, yes. a vice chancellor. Head of Fairfax. Anyway, nobody talked to me, Karen. <laughs> they oh, just no. ignored me. And oh, I, 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 so did you I think know. that you were I like done? Well, <laughs> I thought I was done. I thought, oh my yeah. gosh, I'm so way down on this list. And I had to again just like have that belief of, okay, so I've got to this point and I've just got to I've just got to go for it, you know? Yes. Um and yes. so I, did, I, you know, I didn't get really pushy and start pushing everyone out and start trying to talk to everyone. But I knew I had my 20 minutes one-on-one -on -one with each member of the panel. Okay. And home and, and my father-in-law had given me advice of you know Saint Therese of Lazur just mm. channel the love for the individual person that you're meeting with each mm. member of the panel and so I I guess I just tried to build that connection and I found out then that I got at the end of that day they announced six people had got through to the next day and then I had the whole panel um being interviewing me and and the other six and then at the end of that they was I found out that I got it and, I, and it was just amazing because later on, one of the panel members told me, you were the 13th, you weren't wow. going to be and wow. never in 13 before. And then she said on the final day, there was actually a tie break between three of you we could not decide between, um, but you wow. did get it. So what, I, was I that ex think, yeah, hmm. sorry, what was that experience like when you found out well, that you got yeah, through? It was overwhelming because I felt hmm. like... Um, I guess I felt like you don't get given something like that unless um, you're meant to make some kind of contribution. So I sort That's of felt right. really humbled, blown away and, and overawed by it. And I also felt like for my, for my husband to be James, like we weren't even engaged, but Karen is the first guy I ever kissed and I didn't kiss him lightly. I, I'd sort of waited for <laughs> someone that I thought was worthy of that. And, I, you know, when we kissed, I said, we're going to get married now. <laughs> and he sort of thought, oh, a minute. He wasn't ready. That was just the first, kiss. <laughs> the first kiss. And that was way back. And, oh, um, wow. But I felt like even at that time I'd said to him, I have real dreams for my life and I I want to have children, I think. <laughs> but I, always, I really want to have a career. And he had been on that journey with me, knew that, supported me. But I think when I got the roads and I called him as well, he knew, okay, so like this, this is really serious. You know, mm. I, I'm going to have to support Jello to do yes. the things that she wants as well. And so it, it was a big moment for us and for me. Mm, that's a huge moment. And I love what you said. I'm just going to backtrack a little bit to that moment in the confessional where you brought that sin of jealousy before the Lord. But I, I want to highlight for women too that sometimes this can be the springboard, like whether it's fear or whether it's jealousy or whatever it is, that when, when we see something in somebody else, sometimes it ignites something within ourselves. And there's always the redeemed and the unredeemed side of these reactions that we have. And I guess, you know, bringing that towards the, to the Lord as you did, like he was able through the priest to speak into that and like, why not you? Why not? Like, why wouldn't you? And I think that's a beautiful moment that then had you not have done that, had he not have spoken that into you, you might have missed that moment. But it's that openness yeah. to grace, I think. So I want to encourage women too, because sometimes we do as Catholic women, we're like, oh, this is really ugly part of me. And we try and ignore it or suppress yeah. it. But sometimes just letting that come and letting and exploring it a little bit. And what is this saying to me? Like, what is this revealing to me about myself? Or what is the Lord trying to say to me through this experience or through this emotion of jealousy? And for you, that was the yeah. spring bolt, really, that. Yeah. took you in that direction go yeah. you I'm so proud of you it's so I'm just having a silent cheer <laughs> over here <laughs> having known you as a younger person and and then to see what you've accomplished it's just amazing and 
I think that's what happens when we say yes to the Lord, whether it's big accomplishments on a world stage or in academics or politics or in the home, like the hidden areas of our home. When we say yes, God does extraordinary things with a woman's yes to him. Yeah. So yeah. take me a little bit further on your journey. Obviously, you went and you, you did the Rhodes Scholarship. So, and then what happened? Yeah. And so, in that, yeah, before I went, James proposed. And so we were engaged over long distance. So for a 13 month period, he was in Catherine working as a journalist in the Northern Territory. I was in Oxford and we saw each other three times. Oh, um, wow. So it was pretty epic trying to discern and prepare for marriage um, long yes. distance. But we actually had a book that we were doing it was kind of like 50 questions before I say I do and we had this Tuesday evening date where we would talk on the phone and he was meant to have prepared his section and I would always come with an essay about mine <laughs> and um and then we would talk and it was before kind of zoom there was Skype but we, we actually just did it sure. on the phone and that was kind of our preparation and then um and and Oxford was a tremendous experience again I battled with feelings of kind of jealousy Karen to be honest because you're you? in this environment with people are just like they're really um they're Pick very the accomplished and like yes yeah they're attractive they're, they're intelligent they're articulate and it, it's it's just really it's it's some of them are very wealthy and it's just sort sure. of like whoa who yes. am I in all this um, yeah. and in the middle of that you know I, but I, I loved the work and I was I was researching around um, what kind of rights should someone have when they get sacked from their job? And I think mm -hmm. that's always been something I've been interested in because my father died when I was four. But what I do remember is he had a lot of job stress at the time. Like, a, a, you know, we never, he died suddenly in a drowning accident, mm -hmm. but and we know, know if he was going to be made redundant. But even as a four year old, I kind of, I do sort of wow. have vivid memories. You have of memories, do you? About that. I oh, do, yeah. like lying on the floor of his office and him being on the phone and, and just mm -hmm. seeming stressed. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I know, I guess my passion and interest in in the area of employment and work is the fact that we invest so much of ourselves in our job and it, it's part of our identity and our meaning mm -hmm. sometimes for those of us who work, whether that's in the home or out, mm -hmm. what we do and how we spend our day matters. And so my thesis looked at the idea of arbitrary dismissal. But after about in my second year, I came back and we got married. <laughs> James mm -hmm. came over and it, We'd sort of discern that we would wait about a year before having a child, um, okay. just that we would abstain and sort of and, and be open to life, but 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 probably wait about a year. But after about six months, I attended a session at Oxford called Books and Babies, and okay. um, it was kind of, you know there's not a lot of sessions called that at Oxford. No, I can't, <laughs> I can't imagine. <laughs> But yeah. books and babies that sounds fun so I went to that and it was packed with young women they were all interested in this topic and there was a panel and the senior academic woman who was a professor said don't have babies until you've got tenure and you've got professional security so maybe that message that we get in the world of yeah. you've got to make it then then you can think about you know that, opening yourself yes. up to having children but there yeah. was then also a gynecologist on the panel and she said have babies as soon as you can you know you're the way that you've been created your body is ideally when you're young is the best time yes and and I walked away from that thinking I have met my husband really young I've met the love of my life really young um, I've got a really good draft of my thesis what good reason do I have not to have children now because I knew I wanted to mm -hmm. and I felt like the professor's advice was kind of out of fear like it was sort of mm. like the world limits us career structures and academic institutions and law firms they sort of have this expectation they say they're family friendly but then ultimately they have this expectation of 24 7 employees yes. and um we're then meant to regulate uh, like it's so disempowering for women to have yeah. to regulate your decision about when you want to have children around career and mm. so I sort of thought well you know screw that I, I I want to have children now I had this desire it had come I'd never thought of myself as having lots of children but it sort of had started to come because I'd met James I loved him and I wanted to make babies with him so walked away from that seminar went home to him and I said you know how we were going to wait 12 months why don't we <laughs> let's not <laughs> And because I, I, was love it. Up, I was like, I'm fair class. And so oh, I love it. We actually got pregnant straight away and she was born yeah. our first one at the end of that year, um, wow. which was my, my second year. And it was, again, it was a big shock to the whole Oxford institution because normally when women had babies, they just sort of moved out. But I was okay. like, no, I'm in and I'm here and this okay. is who I am. And yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. And you have five yeah. children now? 
Is that correct? We do. And so after the PhD, I came to Adelaide and um, yes. six months in gave birth to my second. And then sort of every two years for the last had 10 a baby. years, we've had a, <laughs> had a baby. <laughs> wow, that's yeah. amazing. And how is how have you juggled that? Like, has it been, I mean, people look at people like yourself, for example, and it looks seamless and it looks lovely. But I know that the reality behind the scenes isn't always that way, far from it, actually. So just with transparency with women, like, how has that journey been for you? How have you navigated this professional career that you have, which you're obviously called to, with the si yeah. simultaneously with the call to have children raise a family yeah because I always wanted to be a really present mum my mum being a single mother um and she didn't work out of the home she was really present and I benefited from that I think I'm a strong woman today from the fact that I had this strong relationship with my mum and she imbued me with self-belief I um so I wanted that I wanted to do that but then I also wanted this career and it's kind of this sort of glamorous mm -hmm. kind of ideology of you can do it all yeah. and so I and so I sort of bought into that as well and I thought okay so I've got to you know and on TikTok they kind of have this um girl called that girl and she's like really attractive and she's really intelligent and she's got a baby on in tow and the really hot husband and yeah but only see, one baby it, right only yeah. one baby I always say yeah. one child is an accessory <laughs> like it's like easy yeah. I feel what? like I just now that I've like been on this journey I know it's mm. just such a myth yeah. um just such, like such an absolute myth that it just is yes. so glamorous and perfect I think like the reality is when I post on Instagram or when I walk into my lectures or when I'm meeting with you Karen I'm wearing my makeup I've got my nice coat on and you know? um <laughs> this is kind of my professional yeah it's my professional work face but mm -hmm. the rest of the time I, you know, I've got, I'm breaking out in pimples. My hair is frizzy. I'm in like my dirty stained home clothes. And, and it's sort of like, but I'm also comfortable with that, you know, mm. like I'm comfortable with, with being both. I think the thing is I had to work out along the way, like how do I make sure I'm really present to the children yes. and then pursue my career? And I kind of, if I can go into some depth, depth Karen, I guess I, like Please. for the first couple of years, I sort of thought, okay, so I knew in my head the order was like family then work, but the reality I think of what I did in the early years was I pushed myself really hard with my work. Mm. I had a flexible job, so I only had to go in on the days that I was teaching and then the rest of the week I could do research and as long as I was kicking goals and publishing and making a big impact, then that was fine. And I, I've always been at the top of research for my, for my institution, so I kicked that goal really well. But the thing was... I sort of pushed myself so my children like when they were young they would have on a sleep schedule and the minute they would go to sleep I would get my laptop out and start working mm -hmm. and um and like I didn't give myself any breaks or any rest and like with my first daughter in Oxford she would go down to sleep at 10 in the morning two hour nap I'm working then she gets up we play together eat um then she's down at two I immediately work again and then four o'clock she's up and so I kind of would work a four-hour day in Oxford when I came in suddenly had a full-time job I had to work around that and we didn't mm -hmm. my mum had been really anti-child care so I kind of carried that baggage mm -hmm. and so I thought I never want to put my kids in child care but then after the birth of my second child I really crashed and was hospitalized for postnatal um, depression and anxiety mm -hmm. I wasn't eligible for maternity leave so I was literally going back to work within three weeks to teach and coordinate a big wow. course and yeah. two children under 18 months um no yeah, child care yeah. or, or really any support in Adelaide like my in-laws were here and they were willing to do one day a week and that was amazing but I also had no friends because we just moved here yeah. it was it was really 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 hard and mm. through working with a psychiatrist I realized I need to have like more of a community around me and more of an infrastructure and so yeah. you know we at that point started to pay a lovely lady who would come in for two hours and clean and that just helped you know yeah um because I get anxious when the house is messy and um I think one of the things I found hard about having children is all of it was out of control and so <laughs> all of the house time clean, <laughs> all the time so the house <laughs> was clean that made me feel better and then I started family daycare for my daughter one day a week and again that was just amazing just to have that one day yeah. My husband did one day, my in-laws did one day. So then it was just me two days at home where I had to juggle work and her. Yes. Um, but also my son had been born. Like it, it's been a journey to work out how to do this. And I, mm. I don't think it's been perfect. And I think actually I've become a way better mother 
because once I had three, I really just knew what to do. And I found there was nothing babies three, four or five could throw at me that I couldn't handle because yes. <laughs> I just knew what I was doing. It was like I had a PhD in mothering and I could yes. just do it. But those first years, they were hard. They're hard. Yeah, they are. Yeah. I remember Jonathan and I couldn't have children for six years and we had our daughter and then um, 14 months later, our son. And so we ended up having three kids in three years. And I think... I when my son came along, my second child, it was a real juggle. Like I do remember that. Just one child was an accessory. We could kind of work around that, but two was harder. Um, and it, it was challenging. Like I, I found myself just in severe sleep deprivation. It is really hard. And I think one of the most damaging messages, which I'd really love to speak into today, is that message that you know, you can have your babies and then you can pursue everything you want to do. And it's actually not fair to place that on women because you can't, you can't do it all at the same time. And it's delusional to think that you can or to put that expectation on women. And even in Catholic circles, we have this um, idea because I, I think where it's coming from, it's coming from a good place that women still, you can still pursue your dreams. It's coming from this idea that um, you know, you're not just locked up and you don't have to deny yourself, I guess. So it's coming from a good place. But what I experience with the women that I work with is that actually what you're pointing to as anxiety and depression, they're feeling so much pressure because they're told you can do it all and you can pursue the career and pursue your dreams and have the babies and everything. And they simultaneously, I can tell you, most of the women that I'm coaching and working with have hit this crash point where they just, they can't do it all. And so yeah. I think it's really important to to acknowledge that. You, it's that saying, yeah. you know, you can't, what's the saying about the cake? I've, it's just, you can have, what is what is the cake one? You can have, I don't know, whatever oh, yeah. it is. Like, Eat your cake and have it too, or something. That's something. the one. Okay. Yes, but you know you can't have it all at once, and and I'm really big on that. And I do believe um, that when your kids are really little, like investing in them and and building those bonds is so important. Yeah. And and I think. I think that's yeah. No, I was I, just um... going to say that that attitude in the world. I think we really do need to challenge it because there is a pyramid of priorities vocationally for us as Catholic women, and it starts with our Eucharistic relationship with the Lord, then ourselves, believe it or not, then how we're choosing to live out our vocation to love, whether that's married, religious life, a single life, and then the children, and then work, then ministry and friendship. And I think when we scramble that order, as we often do, and I have been guilty of it myself, putting kids above even my own health sometimes like you know we can scramble that pyramid of priorities but god has told us how to do it and so if we can start to filter our choices and what we're committing to through that lens of that pyramid of priorities then we have a greater flow and, and the grace then in terms of what we're doing even though it might be hard there's grace and flow there yeah i think that's right i think that's why i was actually able to have more babies is because i through making a lot of mistakes in the early years, I kind of worked that out, that yes. you've got to get the order right. Um, yeah. So like by baby number three, I'd realised um, mm. that I paid lip service to putting family above work when in reality the way that I was spending my time and how I was structuring everything, like that idea of the two-hour nap, to get to work straight away, yeah. that was ridiculous. I realized. Like That was so unfair on myself. I needed to have a nap. I needed yes. to read a book um, or go for a walk or just have a cup of tea. Like the idea that I would just be superwoman who would put her baby down and then just immediately head to, you know, my workstation and work straight away with my mind switched on. That was just absurd. Um, yeah. And it was a ridiculous pressure that I put on myself. And so I have, by baby number three, I worked out a structure for my, from every single day so that, um, yeah. You know, like in, actually in the middle of the day, I sort of stop and I, I have a 10 minute power nap every day. And I actually, um, I do. And then I wake up and I have a cup of tea because um, I like baking. So I'll have something that I've baked. And if I'm at work, I, I do this as well. I have a couch in my office. <laughs> and I, um, and then I have a and then I have a prayer time because I and so I I have lots of books that I read like I bought a couple kind of show you so I've got this book called Seven Women that I got from Kurong, um, yes. this one called Fighting for Life like these different yes. sort of books that kind of of, of people that I really admire or um, giants in the faith and I are women who have changed the world through their 
through their advocacy and their compassion. And so then I read about them and then I'll, I'll open up my Bible and I, I just do that. And that's kind of like my anchor point in the day. Mm. And it's not at the start of the day because I'm not one of those women who can wake up really early <laughs> and do that. I just, I've tried. I've listened to those podcasts about the women that get up really early. And, I know. And, you know they, I have they one of those quiet. husbands. It's very, yeah. I've never understood it myself. <laughs> I, I try, but yes. <laughs> yeah, so I find for me that structure has it's been a lifesaver um but then i also try to get on retreat during the year about twice a year um actually during the week on a wednesday it's kind of like i sort of call it my mental health day um so i make sure i'm getting to the gym i've got extended time like the 10 minute power nap's a bit longer and it's a working from home day if i can because then i've just got that flexibility and i'm not having to wear makeup and yeah um, I find I need those things because otherwise I pick up the kids from school and I'm just anxious and stressed mm. and it's not fair on them because they've had a big day at school and they need me to arrive being sort of just positive and calm with the afternoon tea ready. Like that's their needs and I need to meet that. It took me a while to work that out though. Yeah, it does. And we, and this is the thing, we talk about the way it should be or the way we do it, but we've arrived at that point through a lot of trial and error. And, you know, it, it's perfectly imperfect the way we get there. It's just working it out about what works for you and what works for the family or for where you're working and sort of just putting yeah. in place some of those structures. And I think the word structure is really good because when you have a lot of demands on your time and your energy, and just your body, your mental health, all of that, sometimes having structure where you don't actually have to think about what you're going to do next is really helpful. I know for myself, Fridays, I'm just, I do the groceries and I do the house and get ready for the weekend. And even if I don't feel like it, it's just become such a habit now that that's what happens every Friday. And it's it's very helpful and exercise too is, is sort of scheduled in there. And I think what you're saying, yeah, what you're touching on there is just how much that has helped you and being the saving grace for you and for your yeah. flourishing so that you can pursue both the callings that God has placed on your heart. Yeah, I realised I couldn't be gentle with my children if I wasn't gentle on myself. Like, mm. and um, the franticness, like I think our world kind of tells us we've got to be really busy. Mm. And I just feel like... Um, and I don't always model this perfectly, but I do try to model to the children around just having that sense of peace um, and that availability uh, mm. to people that might knock on the door or to them when they need me. And it's something I've sort of learned is like, so my kids go down pretty early, like the younger three are down by 6 p.m. Nice. Um, and so then I kind of do. <laughs> I've got teenagers I, I now. <laughs> Yeah, that would be hard with my older two I ask them to read at that time so it's like a quiet nice. time and they read but I'll lie in bed then with my laptop and and do my work but if one walks in I kind of I'm trying to do this of just putting the lid down and and, and looking at them and being present yes. to communicate that it's then more important than my work and mm. whatever I'm doing on my laptop um yes. I know that's something a realization I had when I had my second child was um, maybe about six months after he was born was at the end of my life I want to look back and know that I was you know that the people around me closest to me knew how much they mattered and how much I loved them and they were that I invested in them um, mm. no matter what accolade I might get work none of it matters in the end um, yeah. rather, other than sort of the love that like that that, that sort of so I try to live by that sometimes it's hard to oh, make every decision with that through that that's lens. right so that's, that's it's sort of navigating that with that as your <laughs> yeah. your guiding star I love um there's a beautiful quote from Saint Scholastica that said your life is not an endless to-do list it's a journey of love mm -hmm. and I have that on my yeah. fridge because you know it's so easy just for us to slip back into that hustle and whether you've got children or you're in your religious life, you, I love this aspect that it's already decided for you, the rhythms of prayer and work and rest. But the single life, professional life, you know, married life, having children, like we can so easily get caught up in that world of that hustle and that busyness. And what ends up happening is really we're sacrificing ourselves and the things that matter most on that altar of productivity and I think it's very good to be reminded just to come back and take inventory of our lives about what's working, what's not, what can I improve? And and listening to other women, like you just sharing your story today, some of those tips and ideas on how women can actually, I guess, create rhythms of rest in their life 
so that they can be, I guess, available to those who need them. Yeah, that's right. And I think you can plan things. Like as women, we do have to-do lists and we try to plan things a lot of the time. But I think ultimately I do know that um, my life is not my own and that um, I need to surrender those to-do lists and those plans. And I experienced that after the birth of my fifth child. So he he was the one that sort of really came along as a surprise. Yes. Um we used a natural method of fertility but he the first four were kind of timed around my uni schedule and my work and where we were at as a family and the fifth one um he I'm just going to admit it Karen I'm a massive control freak (laughs) and so like when we got married I'm just going to say I've got four diamonds on my ring like my and um I said to my husband let's get four little diamonds on our wedding ring and they can be our four children and so like in my worldview it was four children and I know (laughs) yeah and I know that doesn't sound very like you know open to life and <laughs> but that was just sort of me I was like okay four kids by the time yes. I'm sort of 32 and then I can conquer the world like that was what my immature sort of 24 year old brain thought yes yeah, sure. and then when I found out I was pregnant um at 34 with my fifth and then you go to the hospital and you find out okay I think I was 35 and they said you're a geriatric pregnancy and at the time <laughs> you're like time oh. work I'm not that old. <laughs> work, work was really stressful that year in 2019. It was so hard. And I was really, really struggling actually at work. Um, and then to find out I was pregnant and I had to go to Geneva um, when I was three months pregnant for this work trip. And I was really battling morning sickness and nothing looked good on me. I was putting on mm. so much weight. And my husband, bless his heart, took me out on a date night into the city because I'd given away all my baby stuff, paternity clothes, everything. And um that's how certain I was that God's plan was my plan. Yeah, and um, <laughs> we went on this date. You and- know that it's going to all be turned upside down. <laughs> <laughs> and so then, I remember we went to shop after shop together and I, nothing looked good and I was actually crying. Oh. And he, you know, in the end he helped me buy some things. He's like, you look really good. Like he tried to be just so encouraging. Even the beautiful. shop assistants were like, you look amazing. And so we like we bought me some new clothes, which made me feel just that little bit better, I think. And um, and then as that pregnancy went on, I still kept thinking like, how am I going to cope? This is really hard. But I was actually struggling with a difficult boss at the time. She didn't as she added, we didn't connect at that point. But when I told her I was pregnant, I, I normally go into work with my like face really on, you know, that I, I was sort of struggling to keep up the mask because I was just really low. I my psychiatrist said I had situationally induced depression. Mm. And um um when little when the little fifth one came along and came out, um, it was at the start of 2020. Um oh, and I was still pandemic really, I was still struggling. Yeah, I was really but we didn't know the pandemic was gonna hit, but about no. four weeks later it did. And all my colleagues were scrambling to put their classes online and to learn the technology and to cope with the pandemic and everything that it didn't have. But I just had the most blissful year in the end because oh, all the beautiful. pressure was off because I wasn't at work. I had this little one that I could lean into. Mm-hmm. And because work had been so stressful in 2019, I think I really let go of my career that year. I decided I might not even come back to this. Like I, I had serious okay. conversations with husband about like will I go back to my workplace because this is this is really hard I don't feel valued or supported and um over 2020 it was amazing like I really transformed as a mother because I think really up until that point I'd always talked about motherhood as being like my vocation but that year was when I discovered it this little unplanned Mm -hmm. baby was the year where I really found it and do I have time to tell you a bit of a story yeah absolutely love you too (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so my, old, my older daughter who's amazing um I think I was really tough on her and I, I struggled a lot like controlling my anger when she was little mm. um yelled at her and smacked her and and really mm. struggled with that actually like it wasn't all the time it might have been once every six months I'd lose my temper because I was quite yeah. tightly wound yes. and she pushed my buttons and I realized we're very similar she's headstrong yeah. it's and, always um, those that are similar to us <laughs> yeah, it would be it would be stupid things like she wouldn't wear her jumper when it was cold for school and I would just get disproportionately irate mm. by that it would make me so angry that I'd like try and push it onto her yeah. and like wait it was too forceful you know like I look back and I think that now I know that now anyway um uh like I, I worked on that with my psychiatrist like my anger and and how to like take the deep breaths go to a separate room think you know and then realize okay the jumper is on. <laughs> whether she's wearing a jumper or not it's it's not the biggest deal you don't need to like 
you you you, you, yes. you can't like lose your self control over something like that or anything actually like mm. nothing should make me tip over to that point of using force yeah. with anger anyway so and I had these high expectations I remember she came home from school and my mum had been quite pushy academically and I, I guess I thought okay I've got to be like that too but I didn't know how to be she came home and we were doing a homework in her in her first year of school and I remember getting really angry at her because she just wasn't getting the concepts and and I look back and think oh that was really bad um yeah. but anyway when my fifth was born and every holidays we kind of do a Kurong trip um yes. but number three was going to her friend's house for her first full day play date so the older kids all the kids bar number three and I went into Kurung and bought stuff and had a really great journey and we were talking on the way home in the car we we're talking about moral dilemmas and we we're just talking things through got a call from the mum who said um your daughter's really struggling I don't know what to do because she doesn't seem that happy and I said well why don't I pop by and just see if she's okay so I drove by popped and saw her and said are you okay and she said yeah I'm fine she was happily sitting on a couch eating popcorn by the time I'd got there and I said do you want to come home with me she said no I'll stay for the whole day mum it's fine I went back into the car and as we drove home, my eldest daughter said to me, mum, you would never have done that for me. You would, mm -hmm. and I said, what, did you, what do you mean? She said, you would never, like if I was struggling at a play date, you would never have come and got me. You would never have checked in. You would have said toughen up. And you would have even said to me like, you, you're being sulky. Don't you think you should be more loving to the other kid? Like, how do you think Nora would feel that you're, mm -hmm. you know, not getting into it? And yeah. instead of just going, oh, so annoying. She's telling me off again. I just, there was this moment of grace where I just felt you're right. And I think it was a moment of grace that I was open to because I was in that, I'd had my fifth child. I was finally really leaning into motherhood and I was yes. open and available. And, um, and mm -hmm. I was like, you're right. Um, mm -hmm. I would have been really tough on you. Uh, you're right. I'm sorry. And mm -hmm. she, I saw through the rear view mirror, a little tear. And I said, oh, Laura, uh, I said, oh, um what like I sort of said so you're right and I'm sorry and she said um she said I didn't think you were going to say sorry I thought you're going to argue with me and I said I think and I said look something I've never shared with you guys is I really struggled when you were born and and when Jesse was like the second one was born I really struggled emotionally and mentally I had put a lot of pressure on myself yes. and um and she said um and I said, I was really tough on you. And I know I smacked you really hard at times and I yelled at you and I, and I named a few times. In fact, because I, I can think of them, there were sort of six or mm. seven times over the course of her mm. first four or five years. And so I named the times and she remembered all of them, actually. And wow. um, I said, I said, I'm so sorry for all of them. And I have been sorry for a while. And, and she said, I know that you're changing, mum. Like I've been oh, this wow. year, I felt you being different. Like I, she's quite emotionally intelligent. Yeah. She said, I, I, I know that you've changed. And But she said, like, one of the reasons I feel really jealous of um, our number three, she said, one of the reasons I feel jealous of her is because I can tell that I've got two daughters and my yeah. eldest is mean to that one, or she was actually, she's not yes. anymore. She yeah. said, it's because you're so nice to her. You don't put any of the pressure on her that you put on me. And I yeah. said, well... I'm so sorry. It's because by the time she was born, I'd worked on my mental health and yes. I'd changed. Yes. And, she, and, and, you know, that conversation, we ended up parking outside our house mm. and, like, the baby and the five-year-old, they were sort of just, like, I don't know what they were doing. My son, who was, like, nine, was listening and he was interested. But she came and sat on my lap and we just talked for two hours. It was this incredible moment of grace where something shifted oh, and I was able to apologise. Mm. She named every time that I hadn't named, like just other little things or big things. And I said mm. sorry and asked for forgiveness and I explained. And I feel like if I hadn't been open to that fifth and had that fifth child and yes. had that year of the pandemic, then none of those, like I, I, I really believe in Romans 8.28, God can bring good out of anything Everything. he brings yes. good out of all things for those who love him and I felt like with my daughter I, I'd been carrying so much guilt about mm. the parenting in the early years mm. um what a healing she, moment so it was and, and and we 
and and that was kind of I think um two and a half years ago now and we like we are really close and she's also transformed since that moment too like she has worked out what she wants to do with her life I know that sounds crazy because she's young but she's really she's really changing and growing and and Mm. developing strength and courage and I feel like that was a moment of grace that shifted Mm. things for her and I but then our whole family Um, Yes, so powerful, isn't it? And I think what you're touching on there is like as adults, like there is this power imbalance, children and parents, and like we expect them to apologize when they've done the wrong thing. But it's actually a great moment of humility and grace when we as parents can apologize and ask forgiveness from our children, where it's warranted, obviously, and where we feel convicted. But that's it's it's such a beautiful story, (laughs) Joe. Things. Yeah, I, really beautiful. I'm so grateful for it like I I feel like that was life-changing for her and for me because um yeah. I just like forgiveness is really powerful and it, it amazed me that she could forgive me so wholeheartedly yes and and that we could really start again you know that just like that blew my mind um, and it's such a beautiful testimony to the power of redemption and, and the ability yeah. of Christ to reach in and restore what is broken. So whether it's a relationship with a child or whether it's your own mental health or whether it's a broken marriage or friendship or whatever it is, Christ has that power. He has the same power he had when, you know, he was walking on this earth today. And we read that yeah. in the living word. And so I think as Catholic women, we, you know, there is an invitation to return to that place really and to really claim, I guess, the power in scripture and the power if we, we we say that we're Catholics, we say that we're Christians, but are we actually living by that? And do we really believe that God can reach in and restore and redeem those broken parts? So, so beautiful. Your story is amazing. So tell me now, you're associate professor. Yeah. And so yes. and in my academic work, I uh, largely look at um, justice and vulnerability of migrants at work. Yes. Um, and so I sit on the federal government's ministerial advisory council on skilled migration. And, um, you know, I've been invited by the prime minister to go to the job summit. So I, I work at that level. Um, but something that has really, um, in the last 18 months, something that's really, I, I guess I felt really outraged by the injustice of is, yes. is the issue of abortion and so yeah. this is a big step out for me because when I've been researching in migrant work I've kind of been towing the progressive line, the line. and so the yes. media and yeah the line like you know I think who's not for ensuring that migrants are treated the same way as as yeah. Australian workers you know, like it's sort of a it's kind of an, in some ways, it's an easy one to prosecute because I mm. it, I think people sort of naturally think about the justice issue there. But um, last year in South Australia, we legislated abortion up to birth. And so it, it meant that gestationally viable babies could just have their lives ended. Um, and they talked about putting safeguards into the law. But the reality is the whole model is predicated on choice and woman's choice. And mm. so medical practitioners defer to woman's a uh, woman's choice and um if that choice is to end the life of the baby in her womb then so be it that that is what the law now allows and actually wall to wall across australia babies can get aborted right up until birth and when i started to look into this mm-hmm. karen i really it just blew my mind um just just the numbers the sheer numbers like every year in australia there's 88,000 abortions um you know, in Victoria, for example, a full-term baby that was perfectly physically healthy and the mum was physically healthy, she was aborted at 37 weeks and my own son was born at 37 weeks. Wow. So as I discovered some of these things, and, like, I will say in my early 20s I was actually pro-choice because I thought that that's what I had to be. I thought mm. I'm a feminist, I believe in women's empowerment, so therefore we need abortion. But then when I looked into what abortion is, and that was an evolution in my mid twenties. I started researching it, and I looked at kind of the violence of what abortion is. Like, I guess I sort of thought in my head, oh, it's just like a clump of cells. Mm. But when I looked at pictures and video, I realised it's actually a baby with a human form, separate mm. DNA, um, distinct, unique, you know, human person. Yeah. And so that's some a journey I've been on since my mid twenties. But last year, it crystallised for me. If I don't speak up for this incredibly voiceless minority, then who will? 
Mm. And it was really scary because I know like the attacks have already started. Yes, because really you're pretty hard. vocal on Instagram. <laughs> I was like, yeah. I was watching, I was like, wow, good on you. Like you're really boldly taking that space and, and having a voice. And there's that beautiful quote, that, you know, all we need for evil to flourish is for good men and women to do nothing and to sit by on the sidelines. And so God's obviously got to, you know, play something on your heart there to be that voice. Yeah, so we'll, yeah. We'll I mean, I think, yeah, I, if, if I could call out to your listeners to follow me on Dr. Joanna Howe on Instagram, because I'm just trying to do short pieces which just explain basic truths. So the fact mm. that nine out of 10 babies with Down syndrome get aborted and it's because they've got Down syndrome. And yet if they were born, we would say we're totally against disability discrimination. Um, yes. The fact yes. that babies feel pain in the womb, the fact that abortion ends up breaking their limbs and crushing their skulls, that's what a surgical abortion is, like it's violent and there's no pain relief. Mm -hmm. And um, these are things I think that we as Australians need to know it's happening in our country and it's, it's the biggest human rights issue of our time. Mm -hmm. And I felt like it's, it does such a damage to women to paint abortion as a quick fix because I, mm -hmm. and I have a girlfriend who's had one and she she got pregnant in her late teens and and she's she's really regretted that decision and experienced a lot of pain but again the media and the abortion mm. advocates will tell you oh post-abortion grief is not a real thing and I, so yeah. I feel like part of the reason I'm I have those research skills is perhaps to yes. speak kind of evidence and some data into this space yes fantastic well we'll be praying for you and i do encourage i'll put the link below your instagram handle for women to come and follow you and support the good work that you're doing because not everybody is called to be in the public sphere and to influence in that way and to be a voice but we definitely need to get behind the women who are called to do that and to support them so i just want to thank you so much joanna for your time and for sharing so vulnerably and openly about your journey i really hope and pray that's a gift to the women listening well ladies I hope you enjoyed that episode with Dr. Joanna. If you'd like to find her, you can do so on Instagram. You can find the link in the show notes. And I really want to encourage you to go and follow her and support the work that she's doing. Ladies, if you find yourself relating to any of the things that Joanna spoke about, whether that's discerning career, learning how to do the juggle, if you're struggling with anxiety and depression and motherhood, or any of those other mindsets or struggles that we face as women, can I invite you to take a look at our Catholic coaching programs for Catholic women? In these Catholic coaching programs, we deep dive into some of the mindsets that hold us back, that hold us back from stepping into the call and the fullness of who God created us to be. If you are interested or have any questions, I'd be only too happy to answer them. So please send me an email, karen at geniusproject.co or take a look at our website, www.geniusproject.co. If you like what you're hearing on the Genius Podcast, can I invite you to leave a review and a rating on the podcast platform that you're listening to. This really helps to spread the word and support the work of the Genius Project. Can I also invite you to come and join us on Instagram, genius underscore project underscore daily or on the Genius Project YouTube channel. Next week, we'll be announcing the details for our Catholic Women's Live Virtual Summit, which is always a fabulous event where we draw women from right around the world to come into a space for a couple of days to just receive and be nourished and encouraged in their faith. So ladies, stay tuned for the dates and the details for the Catholic Women's Summit. Until next week, ladies, have a beautiful week and God bless you.